Welcome to another edition of the Corner Booth Podcast here from the Snowden Deli. I'm Aaron Rand from CJAD along with Bill Brownstein of the Montreal Gazette. And our guest today, Dr. Michael Kalin. He is a family physician and head of RLS Cavendish. Uh, thank you. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. So it has been a very busy week uh, in the field of healthcare in the province of Quebec. The a busy health decade. Minister, <laughs> the health minister has basically held a press conference every day for the last two or three days. So there's a lot to cover. Let me start by asking first about this decision by the government um, to force new doctors in Quebec to stay in the public system to basically prevent them from going into the private system and what you think of that because the only director from the government says for a few years it doesn't detail how many years how long or anything else what did you make when you heard that so first of all i think doctors should be in the public system i'm a huge proponent of the public system and i think that it's sort of ironic because we have a government that has been really subtly pushing people private and now they want to legislate against this. Yeah. But it goes both ways. As much as I want doctors to go in the public system, there have to be jobs in the public system. And the government doesn't provide these. And that's the infamous PRIM, the license. And I have some information that you, that you, don't, that you don't know yet. But yesterday, the numbers came out for how many doctors, young graduates, are applying to become doctors in the public system in Quebec. So I'm going to give you the numbers for RLS Cavendish. That's the territory that I'm involved in. Montreal is divided into 12 territories. My territory is a relatively small one. It involves Côte St. Luc, NDG, and Montreal West. We are short 30 doctors. We know this. 30 family doctors. Montreal is short over 500 doctors. The government determines how many new licenses are available every year irrespective of doctors who leave or retire or are on maternity leave or medical leave. And we're getting four new doctors, a whopping four new doctors. Well, at the end of the month, I'm doing interviews. I'm not, I'm not personally interviewing them, that'd be a conflict. But how many new graduates are applying to become one of those four doctors? 15. So we have 15 graduates of family medicine applying for four spots. And the government's now going to say to the 11, other 11, well, we didn't give you a job. You went private, so you're going to have to pay us back. That's quite a racket, isn't it? That's quite absurd. There are 11 doctors who want to work in the public system who are applying, going through this laborious process, onerous. And at the end, they're going to be told, well, you're wonderful, but we don't have a job for you. But if you dare to go private, well, guess what? Uh, we'd like to speak to your bank. You're going to owe us $500,000. That's absurd. You point out that's the whole issue with the problem where like, you have to be uh, where they want you to be, and that's not necessarily Well, yeah, so city. to that point, though, if you're yeah. one of those 11 doctors who doesn't make it, can they send you somewhere else or at least offer you to go somewhere else in Quebec? For sure they can. And there is going to be a second you know, choice that where people can go and maybe they can end up in Gatineau or yeah. the Laurentide or maybe, uh, who knows, maybe the Gaspésie will be a nice place. But some people have families or sure. children and it's not so simple yeah. for people to just move somewhere else. So the government has to look at this and say, we can't force people to work in the public system, you know, with punitive penalties and not provide enough jobs. It's absurd. Are they underrepresented, though, in the regions of uh, family physicians? Sure. 20 years ago, when the PQ government was in and they introduced it, we had a problem where doctors weren't going to the regions. But now, in Montreal, we have an under-representation of family doctors. To give you the actual stats, 55% of residents in Cote de have a family doctor, 62% in Cote St. Luke, NDG, but in the gas base either, over 90%. So why are we giving PREMS to the gas pay Z when they're at 90% and we're hovering around 55, 60%? It's political. Well, it's an it's anti -Montreal, political. another anti-Montreal kind of shot, no? Exactly. All right, well, and it should be about patient care. It should be about what's for the best of the, of the good of the health of the province. It should not be playing politics. So a couple of things in there. First of all, uh, this idea, as you said off the top, where the government last time around said, you know what, we want to encourage the private sector because we have such a backlog of people waiting to find a doctor, to get surgeries done, it would make sense to do that. And basically a flip-flop now saying, no, we have to stop doing that, we want to keep people in the public sector. Yeah. But to your point as a doctor, and we've heard this before, 
Too many doctors look at this and say, you know what, to your point, uh, beyond making more money working somewhere else, my quality of life, my work-life balance is something I'm concerned with. And being in the public sector doesn't allow me to have any kind of work-life balance, at least not the one I'm looking for. Is that accurate? Yes. Although I want to correct one thing. Doctors who go private make less money than the public system. They make less. The public system actually remunerates more. That's called the gap. That's another day, another discussion. Because the government rewards now McMedicine volume. Well, you can get more volume in the public system than you can in the private right. system, of course. But the government has been promoting private, private, private. And we see that the health of the population is deteriorating. And now the latest announcement, the government says, well, forget having a doctor. Right. Let's just get you a, a, a a health individual. A so, pharmacist. Right. You know, a I call, social worker. A social, I call my pharmacist and, and I say, oh, I'd like to renew my medicines. And while we're at it, I hear you're doing hip replacements now. <laughs> and we laugh. Is, are the uh, opticians going to start doing pap smears now? Uh, maybe my barber will send me for a colon screening. It's absurd. You know, we see this in other jurisdictions and in the U.S. They have primary care providers. We see what happens here. It's over diagnosis. It's over testing. Just do it right the first time, for God's sake. I know somebody, and he's in school in, in New York. Right? He calls up his private care provider, and they say, why are you calling? Oh, I've got chest pain. Go to the eMERGE, because the algorithm says chest pain must mean eMERGE. Well, come on. Let's actually put some you know, thought behind yeah. this. Let's take a history. But and, and so when we don't do it right, it costs more. It takes longer. But I, I sort of theoretically get the government's point here. Right? The government says, look, we know we have a shortage of doctors, especially family physicians, right? So rather than you trying to get an appointment with your doctor and having to wait or going on the gap site and trying to get an appointment that way, your pharmacist should be able to answer some of the questions you have. Uh, a nurse practitioner should be able to answer some of the questions you have. Yeah. In theory, that's not a bad idea because it takes some of the strain away from actually having to go to a doctor every time you have an issue. But yes. That, is that wrong? Partially. but. Let's go back to my numbers. Code St. Luke is short 30 doctors. 15 people applied. We're gonna get four spots. The government could have the problem July 1st in Code St. Luke. They choose not to. 20% of doctors are over the age of 60. They're retiring. Many are over the age of 70 and they have big practices. You're right, the administrative burden on family doctors is enormous and this is where really interesting things like uh, AI scribe is going to come out, which will save time as far as charting, filling out forms, and we could use help with this. There's no question. And absolutely, there's a lot of things that we do that can be given to others. Imagine if your dentist was doing all the cleaning. Well, that wouldn't be a very good sure. use of resources. You have dental hygienists for a very good reason. Yes, the nurses, look, we need a lot more nurses. And we talk about going to the private sector. Well, they've got to start the hemorrhage of the nurses going to the private sector too. I mean, we need a lot more nurses. We need more nurse practitioners. They're wonderful. They help tremendously. They're phenomenal. But at the end of the day, we have doctors who are willing to work in the public system. We're just not giving them jobs. And it's called the prem. It's been going on for more than 20 years. I can't think of any place in the world that has a system like this, except maybe North Korea. It's absurd. And yet, this has been the norm, government after government, for over 20 years. Anyway, you, Mr. Uh, Health Minister uh, Dubé yesterday, Thursday, announced that by spring of 2026, he says there are 1.5 million Quebecers without a family physician, but he will rectify that somehow by the spring of 2026 by either provide, making sure there a field of professionals will take care of wh whoever needs the care or failing that, people from the healthcare system where the social workers and pharmacists come in. How optimistic are you about that happening? I know pharmacists who don't want this responsibility. I'm not sure healthcare workers are so keen on expanding what they do. I think they're busy. Mm. And I think that coming back to the main point, we have doctors, they want to work. We're not using this resource. We have foreign graduates, Montrealers who are trained abroad, who want to work here, and yet they can't yeah. get jobs. Why are we not taking this low-lying fruit and making our system better in the short term? I understand we want to make our primary care network more robust, 
you know, more comprehensive. And that's a good vision. But you can't forget the family doctor in this. Family doctors don't want to be managers. I have no interest in overseeing an optician or a social worker or a physiotherapist. I want to have a practice. You know, my father was a family doctor in Ottawa for 47 years. And the one thing that he loved was the relationships. The relationships with patients. That's what patients want. They want somebody who knows them. I give the example always of teachers. Imagine if the government came along and said, you know, we don't have enough teachers, but we guarantee that there'll be a substitute teacher in the classroom every day. Or let's expand it to what Minister Dubey said yesterday. We're not going to have a substitute teacher. We're going to have somebody who knows something about yeah. education in a the room every warm day. Body. There'll be a warm body in the room every day. Isn't that, doesn't that, that sound wonderful? Well, as parents, I think that sounds terrifying. And when it comes to healthcare, it's the same thing. And we have to look at this and say, why do we keep on putting band-aids on band-aids on band-aids? Yeah. It, it seems like the solution to everything is always, let's come up with a new acronym. Let's call it something different. And, and as if that's going to make it better. But we never deal, it's, it's not a difficult problem to solve. It's just there has to be some political courage. The idea that somebody's going to say, let's do what's right, as opposed to let's do what's easiest. Let's not go for a sound bite. Let's actually sit down with maybe all the parties so that this is not going to end at, each, end at the end of each mandate and say, what's our vision here? What do we really want? And it should start with good patient care, not McMedicine, not just fast food indigestion, get them in, get them out. We want high quality care. Let's make the best system in Canada. Let's make the best system in the world if we can as opposed to let's just piece together something that somebody thought up this morning and we'll do a, a media scrum and we'll see what people think about it and then we'll just play with it. There's so many better solutions out there and yet I don't understand why successively, we're going over 20 years now, nobody can get their act together and it just it moves us further away from patient care. And again, I can say to anybody, what would you prefer? A family doctor or a pharmacist taking care of you. No, I'm not bashing pharmacists. I think pharmacists are phenomenal. I think they, they're helping us when it comes to vaccines and blood tests and chronic care monitoring. But people want a family doctor. They need somebody who knows their care. Just like you have a mechanic for your car, or yeah. you have the handyman who you can always rely on who knows you, or your hairstylist. Imagine if the government said, you can no longer choose your hairstylist. We will now have a 811 number that you'll call and we'll send you to a different barber every time. And that's your hair. Let's substitute in health as opposed to hair care. It's terrifying. And yet for some reason, maybe we're just too polite. We just, okay. You know, as you outline all this, I think I heard the minister also say, and this is not new, um, there's some blame being cast on, on doctors, their association as well, saying it's too hard to negotiate. A lot of things, everything in this province comes down to money at the end of the day as well, and the doctors are, to some degree, by virtue of their association, making things even more difficult for the government. Is that a smokescreen? You believe that's the case? I believe largely that's a smokescreen. I'm not involved in any of these negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, however, I believe strongly that the FO, FMOQ's mandate, that's the federation that represents family doctors, is about best practices and patient care. I firmly believe that. When it comes to remuneration, we know that Minister Dubé thinks gap is the end all and be all. He wants to reward access. I'm saying reward quality. Why are you giving money for a quick visit for a healthy individual. Give the resources for chronic care, vulnerables, the elderly. Reward these things in health care. And I don't think the FMOQ is against that at all. I think the FMOQ feels that family doctors should be remunerated fairly, you know, keeping with, you know, our counterparts across the country. But I think the FMOQ believes patient care comes first, not money. And unfortunately, Government after government throws money, and sometimes they use a carrot, and sometimes they use a stick. But take a step back and look at the situation. I, I just, they miss the big picture, which is these are patients. You can't do healthcare without care. And 
I, I it, it upsets me when it's about dollar signs. Yeah. It's about well, it's it's get ready for more of that, by the yeah. way, because there was just an announcement that they're going to be cutting back at certain hospitals in the city because they're way over budget, and it's like cutting back on nurses and uh, at wow. various city hospitals, and you know they make deals on one end and they complain about the money on the other end, and you know when it comes down to it, if money becomes an issue once again, it's good. It's not going to get better. You know, and as you outline that, you think to yourself, if you're in that system, right? If you're a nurse, if you're a practitioner yeah. in that system, why would you want to be in that system when you can go private right. and not have to deal with these headaches to begin with? We go private. I mean, we don't go private. We go public because we believe strongly in the model. I speak to uh, graduates and residents every year, and I'm sort of counseling them on the PREMS and the EMPs, which are other restrictions. And I remind them that when they entered medical school six years ago, they were aware of these restrictions. I remind them that they competed against many others and that they made a passionate appeal that they want to help people in the public system. That doesn't mean we shouldn't make it better. But we went into this with our eyes wide open. And we have to make sure that the public is not penalized for this. It's not our patients' fault what's going on. Sure. And we have to provide good care. Look, I, I, I see I my own practice. I see GAP patients. And patients are incredibly appreciative. And they value good care. And they're almost apologetic when they have to ask another question. They're imposing on us. And I think they recognize the burden that's on us right now. And I, I very much, you know, am, am encouraged by that. But we have to reciprocate. We have to be the advocates for the patients because the patients don't have a choice right now. And, and that's not healthy. Patients should have more power, more rights, more choice, whether it comes to language, whether it comes to choosing your family doctor, access and I think that we forget this that it's about patient care first and foremost and this gets lost in everything the corner booth podcast is brought to you in part by the Snowden delicatessen where we are 75 years in business the home of Montreal's greatest smoked meat plus Carnotzel, potato latkes and the famous Snowden deli party sandwiches that's the Snowden delicatessen do you and I just ask one of the things that and I brought this up when I first saw this is the fact that you introduce new legislation should this become in fact law or new regulation. Some people who wanted to consider studying here will simply say, why? I can go anywhere else, not have these restrictions, and decide what I want to do when I want to do it. Is that a concern? Getting an education in one of the Quebec medical schools is gold standard. I think Canadian education is among the best in the world. I think Quebec is extremely high. I think that when you have somebody who is, has roots in Quebec and they want to stay here, that we should be encouraging that. Um, I, I don't know how many doctors come into Quebec, and when they do, we should, we should embrace them. I came from Ontario, and I came before the Prems. I, I, I was very lucky. Um, they just made it in in 2002. But I, I think that we should encourage locals to apply. We, we, we want to make sure that they are aware of the realities on the ground. And we want them to stay to make their roots, to have families, and to give back to the community. And I think that's very healthy. These are the, these are the candidates who we want to encourage to apply to medical school. Okay. So I think they, I, I hope that they stay here and apply here, as opposed to going elsewhere. And we know that in other provinces, they're doing similar things. I think uh, Doug Ford in Ontario Ontario. just announced that he's putting restrictions on out of province or certainly out of country candidates. And I think that, you know, we should prioritize our own because we want people to stay. How overwhelmed are you? You must be in your practice. I'm guessing, uh, considering the situation, you said you're short 30 doctors in your area. I Uh, am blessed. I am blessed. I I am the medical director of a family medicine group called the GMF in Côte St. Luke. We have close to 20 doctors, and they are, in my mind, the creme de la creme. Um, We see um, our purpose in much the same way. We support each other, and I hope that other groups share similar environments of collegiality and and seeing things uh, with this clarity. And our patients are wonderful, and I get great personal satisfaction in what I do. It upsets me that... 45% 45% of the population does not have a family doctor to call their own. And I see every day people asking if they can become patients in the clinic, and I try to explain the gap. And every time I try to explain it, I get confused myself. And if I'm confused, my goodness me, 
patients must be confused. And it's scary. I see people who have elderly parents um, and they don't have access. I see people with newborns. Um, I people, see people with chronic illness, whether it's diabetes or mental health. Mental health, oh my gosh. <laughs> what a travesty. And now more and more doors are just slammed shut. We can't help you. There's nowhere to refer. And yeah, I mean, I love what I do. You know, and I got that from my father, and I'm so lucky. And my mother-in-law was a nurse at the Jewish General Infectious Disease, and she loved what she did. And and we love the community. And I'm, I'm, I, I love living in Montreal. I want to give back. I want to make it better. And I want the public system to thrive. And I think most doctors feel the same way. Well, let me let me ask this. So we outline a, a variety of problems here. Uh, and certainly over the past couple of days, some of the announcements by the health minister make you scratch your head and wonder where we're going. Yeah. How do we fix the problem? If you could fix this, how do we begin to do that? Oh, what a great question. Okay, so we got to keep this short. Number one, get rid of the prims. My goodness me, you do that, you'll have more doctors instantly. You have more doctors. You know what that translates into? Fewer ER visits. Fewer visits in general because patients don't have to shop around. They don't need to be needlessly retested. They have a home to go. So number one, get rid of the prints. My goodness me, that's the simplest okay. thing. Number but will that, could that ever happen in this of kind of nationalistic... Uh, Absolutely. And in fact, we really thought Minister Dubé was going to get rid of them. Even as a trial period, really? a moratorium this year, mm -hmm. we thought in going to September it could happen. It fell short just at the last minute. But we think we're really close because he's a numbers man. At least that's what he prides himself on being. And you got to look at the numbers, and the numbers don't lie. Montreal needs doctors. We need 500 plus doctors. Okay. And you got to let you get rid of the prems. Oh my gosh! Guess what's going to happen? More doctors are going to be settling roots. They're going to stay. They're going to go to the public system. More doctors are going to go into family medicine because all of a sudden the biggest, the biggest deterrent has been moved away. Patients have choice all of a sudden. Wow, I can go to a doctor who lives in my neighborhood, who sees my parents. This is wonderful. There's a few other things you have to do as well. You have to change how doctors are paid. And that's on the that, that's being discussed right now. You gotta look at quality and good outcome measures. Reward that, not quantity. You have to look at that. You gotta look at the private system in general, whether it's telemedicine and all these corporate companies that are providing telemedicine for uh, for their companies, which is not always so healthy in my mind. You have to look at who owns medical clinics. Should doctors be owning clinics like pharmacists own pharmacies or do we want private corporations owning it? And if you look at who's closing their clinics, it's the businesses. The family doctors keep their clinics open because it's a different outcome. It's about patient care. It's not about profit. And this is actually being solicited right now by the FMOQ. This is on the table. Who should own clinics? And then we can go from there. But the first thing, absolutely, is get rid of the prems. It's going to have instant, instant results, wonderful uh, goodwill. And I think we're going to see right away some positive outcome measures. Okay. And we have to look at the network as a whole. And the network as a whole will never be healthy until we have a good primary care network, i.e., family medicine. There's no shortcuts, there's no... Well, there's no doubt about that, but there, there's a political aspect here that I don't think we can overcome because I think that's why it was, the Prem was instituted in the first place and to give equality, well, alleged equality to the regions and all the rest and that might yeah, But if you're saying those, you know, there's already 90% you said in the Gaspé Z, we've yeah. kind of reached that level. We, yeah, we've achieved that, so why are we still keeping it? I, it's ridiculous, I agree, but like votes are not here for, let's say, certain governments and they are in other areas. Well, you know, I'm going to throw something radical in. I'm going to throw something radical out there. Because of the gap, and the gap is this populational, institutional, 811 big walk in. While we're short doctors in Montreal, salaries have gone up disproportionately compared to the regions. So now you have a financial imbalance because the gap pays more. Well, now the regions may say, wait a second here, we're at a disadvantage. No, no, I think that's right how the remuneration is being done now. Of course not. I, I think remuneration should be based on continuity of care and good outcome measures. 
right? But you may see some movement because of the financial disparity that's going to happen because of the gap. This is an unintended consequence, and we talk about how the Treasury is complaining about how the government is now a billion dollars over budget on health care. Well, there you go. Because we're paying for services that are not necessarily giving us the best outcomes. They're fixated on access. Access doesn't matter unless it's done in the right way with quality. So one of the things we haven't talked about, and this doesn't sort of, you know, necessarily fit into your wheelhouse, is the fact that, uh, for example, if you're a specialist, yeah, you're right. a surgeon, suddenly you have nowhere to actually perform oh. surgery. We've heard that over and over again. Yeah. I don't know how that problem gets fixed. So, oh boy. I mean, that's why we have private health care, exactly. right, to be able to do yeah. those. So, that's why they go back and forth yeah. between private and public. I, I don't think people know how bad that is right now. The government put into place a referral system called CRDS many years ago. This is a centralized booking system for specialists, sort of like your travel agent for specialties. Do you know there's over 100,000 people waiting out in Montreal? I'm going to give you an example of gastroenterology, because who isn't waiting to see a GI specialist? Do you know there's 17,000 people waiting now in Montreal for a GI, right? 20% of those. We're talking 3,500 people have been waiting more than two years. 50%, we're talking 9,000 people have been waiting for more than one year. This is beyond acceptable yeah. wait lists. We're not talking about colonoscopies or gastroscopies. And this can be replicated with physiatry, neurology, ENT, urology. Go down the list. Yeah, I I'm not a specialist, I can't speak for them. But you can see that clearly we have a huge problem with access to specialists. And family doctors see the backlog. And what's going to happen now? We can't see. So now the pharmacist has to deal with the fact that somebody can't see their gastroenterologist or physiatrist. They can't deal with that any more than we can. Now, social workers and psychologists can certainly help with mental health and access to, you know, to psychiatry. That's without a doubt huge. Physiotherapy, occupational therapy are incredibly important. We think about physiatry, chronic pain rheumatology, orthopedics, that's very, very important. So there are big roles for these other health fields. But as last time I checked, I don't think we're dealing with too many physios that are twiddling their thumbs and they don't know what to do, or psychologists that are looking for patients these days. And so we have a crisis in the network across the board. And just like the expression goes, we're shuffling the chairs on the Titanic. We're not creating more opportunities. All that we're doing is we're just renaming it. We're giving it new acronyms. We actually need a plan. And yes, coming back to the first, first point, we need to stop the movement from the public sector to the private. That's the first thing we need to do. And not just for doctors, also for all the allied health professionals, like nurses, especially nurses. I can tell you in my GMF, um, we're a level 11 GMF. That's, that's one of the higher ones. We are short for nurses. We are missing 160 nursing hours a week. What will that translate into, realistically? Cognitive testing. If somebody says, oh, you know, I'm more getting more forgetful. Diabetes teaching, vaccines, um, uh, looking for uh, vascular tests, you know, for circulation. These nurses are the glue that hold us together, but we're missing 160 hours a week. Well, extrapolate this across the 18 GMFs and GMFRs in CS Centre-Ouest, which is only one-fifth of the island. And you can see how we are completely short across the board. And what are the solutions here? Yes, yes, move from the private to the public. But again, it's sort of ironic, going back to my first point. We're going to penalize these people, we're not even giving them jobs. Let's give the people who want the jobs the jobs. <laughs> that seems to be pretty obvious. I think most people don't need you know, to do much more than to look at that and say, well, let's just make sure these people who are applying are placed. You know, is the rest of the country in as bad shape as we are? Uh, I, I don't know the specifics of other well, come from Ontario. I, 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 know, I know that in BC there's not enough family doctors. You hear the same thing in Ontario, and I don't really understand how they're approaching it. I've heard that our model with Sante Quebec is sort of modeling Calgary or Alberta's failed model. That's my understanding, at least. And I I don't know what Sante Quebec is going to bring. Um, I'm a bit nervous that the head of Sante Quebec is the head of one of the private laboratories yeah. in the province, at least on the surface, that does concern me. When the government is saying, on one hand, we want people to use less private services, 
I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I guess the jury will be out. We'll have to judge people based on their actions rather than, you know, maybe, you know, <laughs> conjecture. But certainly um, other provinces are struggling with this. And a big component of this, and I think that people overlook this, our population has grown. We have more immigrants coming in, right? That's okay. It's just a reality. Doctors are retiring. One quarter of family doctors are over the age of 60. And those doctors had much larger practices, 33,000, 4,000 patients, as opposed to a newer doctor who have, let's say, 500 to 1,000. So we, we have a population that is more complex, more knowledgeable, more access to information. What does that mean? More questions, takes more time, right? Patients don't want to be told what to do. Here's the medicine, take it, trust me. Please explain sure. to me, are there alternatives? What else can we do? That's good medicine, right? We want to have collaborative care. It takes more time. And that means more doctors. And is that cost effective? I'm not the economist, but I imagine if you ask an economist, they will tell you that how we're spending our money now is not efficient, right? Looking at crisis-based medicine as opposed to prevention-based medicine. By paying for emergency room visits, that can't be cheaper than seeing people in a doctor's office. Yeah. And you know, I'm not an economist, but I'm quite sure that there is a better model where we could be spending our dollars more wisely. And I'm sure that we're spending more than we were at the beginning of the CAC term, at the beginning of the Liberals' last term, at the beginning of the PQ's term 20 years ago. One thing you didn't address, you talk about retirement, what about burnout? Oh. Uh, you know, it's a whole other issue. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine with like being overtaxed, the situation the way it is today, yeah. how it isn't affecting doctors psychologically, whether they're at retirement age or not. It's got to be difficult. Absolutely. I, I, young doctors are discouraged, older doctors. Uh, Law 11 just came in, which is more oversight, more Orwellian. Kafkaesque reality where the government now wants to see our schedules, tell us who we're allowed to accept as new patients. It's just these extra burdens. But we also have a wonderful job. We get to help people every day. True. We, we, you know, you know when, I, when I see my patient, I'm not thinking about Minister Dubé. I'm thinking about the person in front of me. And they're, and they're nice people. And if we can make an impact and a difference, then that's really rewarding for us. And I feel very, very you know, privileged, if I can use that word. At the end of the day, I go home and I feel like hopefully I made a difference. And I hope that I made people healthier. I hope that I gave some optimism. A lot of this is, you know, Debbie Downer, we're talking about problems, but I think we have wonderful doctors in our network. I think that we are well-trained. I think that we care. I think the FMLQ recognizes this. We want to promote that. You know, one of the things about the gap, we come back to the gap occasionally because it's not all bad because the gap did something very interesting. Family doctors felt undervalued. The gap with a new remuneration model said, we value doctors and we're gonna pay you more. Well, that, that helped morale a bit because all of a sudden family doctors felt, thank you. Thank you, you're recognizing that people don't come in for one problem. There's a complexity to what we do and now we're getting rewarded or remunerated in a, in a fair way. So we appreciate that. So the model has to look at what we do. This fallacy that doctors, that patients come in once a year for one problem, my goodness, I mean, patients come in for six, seven problems. And if they had more time, they'd add sure. more. And because they don't have access, so they develop a list. But in answer to your question about morale, look, I, I work in a group which is very supportive, where we hear each other, where we, we, we can ask questions, we can support each other, and that makes my day wonderful. And I work at the DRMG with 12 other very, very dedicated individuals. I work with other GMF directors in CS Centre West, one of whom is the president of the EMOM, and we all are on the same page. We want to help patients, and that's very rewarding. So we're very unified as family doctors. We all believe in patient care. We all have the same outcome. We, look, I believe Minister Dubé wakes up every morning. He wants to make our system better. I, 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 I firmly believe it. I think he really wants to make it better. Who, who wouldn't? I'm just, as a family doctor on the ground, I'm saying, you have all these resources. I just would like to see you allocated differently and prioritize things differently. Yes, go from private to public. 
but the way you're doing it is not necessarily the right way. I think there's a better way. And I'd like him to listen to the FMOQ and the AMOM and the DRMG towards this. And I think we can, I think we can fix things. I really do. And that's where we will leave it on an optimistic note. If Just I stay, stay healthy, that. though. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Dr. Michael Kalen, thank you so much. My pleasure. Appreciate your time. Thank you. That Anytime. will wrap up this edition of the Corner Booth Podcast. We'll see you again soon.